Our scripture lesson this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark. We're going to be looking at chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Chapter 2, 1 through 12. When Jesus returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. So many gathered around that there was no longer room for them, not even in the front of the door. And he was speaking the word to them. Then some people came, bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. And when they could not bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him, and after having dug through it, they let down the man on which, I'm sorry, they let down the mat on which the paralytic lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this fellow speak in this way? It is blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? At once Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were discussing the, these questions among themselves. And he said to them, why do you raise such questions in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, stand up and take your mat and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, stand up, take your mat, and go to your home. And he stood up and immediately took the mat and went out before all of them, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. God. In, our text, in our text today, Jesus returns to Capernaum after being away for a few days. We're told that when the people found out that he was in the house, so many gathered around that there was no longer room for them, not even in front of the door. How do people know that Jesus is in the house. We have talked about and we know that there is no place that God is not present. We know that uh, there, is, there is no place that we can go or that we can't even get into where God is not present. We can't get away from God and God is always around us. And in a Trinitarian understanding of God, that also means that there is no place where Jesus and the Holy Spirit are not. God is everywhere. We say as believers that Jesus lives in our heart, resides within us. So Jesus is in the house, if you will. He's in our hearts. Jesus is in the house. But how do people know that Jesus is in the house? Our scripture says it was reported that Jesus was at home. But what are the clues that we leave behind for others to know that Jesus is is in us, that Jesus is with us, a part of our lives? Do we leave clues behind that people can see? Can they tell that we are living our lives as Christians and that Jesus is with us? Or is it even more bold than that? Do we actually talk about how much our relationship with Jesus means to us? How important that relationship is to the way that we experience life? I asked a question on Facebook again this week to kind of get us ready for worship. And this week the question was, what do you think keeps people from sharing how important Jesus is to them with their unchurched friends? As of Thursday, 91 people had seen the post, and we had six people offer an answer to the question. And here's a paraphrase of some of the answers that we received. Uh, one person, uh, one says this, some people fear they may not have answers to the questions they may be asked. Someone else wrote, people are not comfortable asking people because they may be judged. Someone said, others just don't want to hear about your faith. And someone else said, people don't want to intrude. These answers seem to represent for me two categories of concerns or two categories of fears. The first is a concern about ourselves, and the second is a concern about the feelings of others. 
On the one hand, it is suggested that there may be some damage done to us if we share how important our relationship with God is with others. We may be judged as those who do not live up to what we say we believe. Or maybe we'll be judged as one of those radicals we talked about last week who are stumbling around and misrepresenting, misrepresenting Christianity, giving it a bad name, and not representing God as who God truly is. The second concern is that someone, uh, that, that, or another concern, excuse me, is, is that if someone asks us a hard question, you know, we talk about how, what Jesus means to us and how he's helped us in our lives, and that spawns a question that perhaps we not, might not be ready to answer. So we're afraid to even begin the conversation. On the other hand, there is concern for the feelings of others, and that sharing about how important Jesus is to us will somehow offend or intrude on someone else's life. I think these answers point out what is a real concern for many people who have a relationship with Jesus. We are either embarrassed about the way we live our lives, even though we claim to have a relationship with Jesus, or we are so unsure about what it is we really believe that we don't know if we can intelligently answer questions that may come up when we talk about what Jesus means to us. Or instead of being confident that Jesus is the answer to the many needs of our unchurched friends, we are more concerned about intruding or offending others. In order for the crowd to gather around Jesus in our scripture today, they had to A, know what Jesus was capable of, and B, know that Jesus was in the house. The only way for people to know what Jesus is capable of is for them to see the results of Jesus' power in the life of someone else whose life has been changed by knowing Jesus. In our text today, the crowds gathered around the house where Jesus was because they had seen what he had done in the lives of others. If you read the first chapter of Mark, which leads up to today's reading, you would have seen how Jesus had restored many people to wholeness. His early ministry is unveiled in, in the first chapter of Mark, and he's healing people all over the place. A life that is broken and has now been restored is a witness to the power of Jesus. We don't have to be experts in theology to talk about what Jesus has done in our own lives. The results speak for themselves. D.L. Moody was once challenged to, deb to debate with an atheist. He accepted the challenge, challenge with one proviso. He said, I want you to bring me every person you can whose life has been changed by the power of atheism. I want you to bring me those who were drunkards until they became atheists and are now sober. Those whose lives were broken but have been made whole by believing in atheism. Those who have become better husbands and fathers since having turned to atheism. Those of us who live, whose lives have been made better because of our relationship with Jesus are a living testimony to those whose lives are still lives of pain and brokenness. But there is no witness to the power of Jesus for our hurting friends if we live in fear and do not offer our witness as proof of God's transforming power. Paul writes these words to the Romans. The same Lord is Lord of all and is generous to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how are they to call on one in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in one of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone to proclaim him? People's People whose lives are broken don't just walk into a church on Sunday morning on a whim. They crowd the door of the house where Jesus is because they have heard and seen what Jesus can do. And they want that kind of healing power in their own lives. I think we have established that our fear is the number one reason we don't share what God has done for us through Jesus Christ with others. John says this about, about love and about fear in our bodies. There is no fear in love, 
But perfect love casts out fear. For fear, no, fear has a high, high pitched voice. <clears throat> For fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because God first loved us. Our love for God and for those who are dealing with hurting and broken lives is what drives out the fear we have of sharing the power God has to heal with God has to heal with those who are hurting and broken. If we truly believe that God does have the power to turn lives around, to make people whole, to heal the broken and the hurting, then it is the love of God and the love for these hurting and broken people that drives out the fear we have in sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. One of the greatest examples of this kind of love uh, to overcome any barrier to bringing someone to Jesus can be found in today's text. There was such a crowd around the house that the door was even the crowd was surrounding the house and, and I assume was deep full of people and, and they could not get to the door where Jesus was. For the context of this message, we can think of that crowd as a barrier to bring someone who needed the power of Jesus in his life to Jesus. What is the barrier? What's that crowd in your life? What is the barrier that keeps you from bringing the good news of Jesus' power to someone who needs the power of Jesus? Whatever it is, think of the crowd in this story as that barrier, that door to Jesus that is blocked or closed. But notice that these four people love their friends so much that they would not let that barrier stand in their way. In our reading this morning, they took the bold step of climbing up on the roof of the house and digging through the roof and lowering their friend down right in front of Jesus. Talk about multiple reasons to fear. Climbing up on a roof is hard enough, but carrying a mat with someone who is paralyzed on it up to the roof has got to be pretty hard. I don't know about you, but I would be very afraid to destroy someone else's property, but these four dug right through the roof. The point of the story for me is that they let absolutely no obstacle stand in their way. Not their fear of what others would say, not their fear of being judged, not their fear of intruding on what was going on in the house, not the fact that it was going to be hard and take some work to accomplish their goal. They loved this man they knew his great need. They believed that the power of Jesus could make him whole. And they did what they needed to do to bring a broken life to Jesus. We who are bold enough to claim to be followers of Jesus need to understand that it is God's plan. It is God's plan to reach others through us. This is not our plan. It is the plan of God. We did not design this model. We are following God's will and God's way of reaching broken people. And it is not a plan that is based on our power, our gifts, our skills. It is a plan based on the power and love of God for the whole world. When a door is closed, there is always a roof that can be opened. Who do you know that is broken and needs the healing touch of Jesus? What is keeping you from bringing the love of Jesus to this person? How has your life already been a witness to the power of God to this person? Do you believe that Jesus is the answer to this person's broken life? What fear is keeping you from sharing the life-giving power of Jesus with this person? And do you believe that your love of God and your love for this person can overcome your fear? If God has placed a name on your heart this morning, then I challenge you to make a plan that will allow you to share what God has done for you through Jesus Christ and the hope in Jesus that is available for that person. Remember, you are not alone in this. The power of God is with you. 
It is, after all, God's plan for the redemption of the world. There are also others in this church who would be more than willing to talk with you about how you might be able to share God's love with someone else. Everyone needs the compassion of God. God's healing touch in their lives. And our God is mighty to save. Won't you share the love of God with those whom you love?